So you'll say the Guinness family offered the money of $300,000 and the ones that you see on the right. Oh, the the generosity of the Guinness family. Good morning. There was a magnificent celebration on, over, under, and around the Lionsgate Bridge last night when another of Grace McCarthy's dreams came true. Due to the generosity of the Guinness family, the Lionsgate Bridge is now magnificently illuminated for the next year for Vancouver's centenary and for Expo. Steve Wyatt was at the party. The night began at the Pan Pacific Hotel in Canada Harbour Place where guests of the government boarded the Queen of Tawasson ferry, which took them out underneath the Lions Gate Bridge. On board, there was a gala party, and at that time, the Premier gave his thanks to the people who made it all possible, the Guinness family. What we're doing is uh, taking advantage of the very generous gift of the Guinness family to light up Lions Gate Bridge, and then, then when people come to Expo, uh, which is uh, British Columbia's year, whether they come by land or sea or air, uh, they'll see uh, Lionsgate Bridge, which is a symbol of, of uh, the building that's taken place to build British Columbia, but how it can also be very beautiful and attractive. The Vancouver Fireboat offered its own tribute, and back at the Pan Pacific Hotel, the light in the dome started to flash, offering a signal to begin to turn on the lights. It took a while, two minutes, to warm up, and you couldn't see them at first, but there was a large crowd on the beach at Ambleside Park offering their encouragement. Finally, they came on. This is the view from Ambleside Park, and then from the causeway in Stanley Park, a familiar view for commuters to the North Shore. Alex Fraser offered his warning that people should keep their eye on their traffic and not on the light. Here's the view from atop Cypress Bowl, looking down on the city sky. This will be here for the next year. A $300,000 project with the money given to the provincial government with much persuasion from Grace McCarthy to light up the Lionsgate Bridge. And, of course, it changes the nighttime face of the lower mainland. We are, however, going to deal with more mundane political matters this morning, because what British Columbia has faced since 1953 is the politics of polarization. It's got to be social credit on the right or the NDP on the left, and who knows when that particular strange uh, mixture will, as it must do, one day collapse. So I've asked the leaders of three very minor political parties in British Columbia to come this morning and ask them why they don't get together if they're all that keen to defeat social credit and form a middle-of-the-road party. There is, of course, here uh, the one-man member in the House of his one-man party elected, Graham Lee, former NDP -er, who heads his United Party. There is Peter Pollan, former mayor of um, Victoria, who has been in a couple of parties in his day, but is now dedicated to defeat social credit. And there is Art Lee, former Liberal MP, who heads the BC Liberal Party, and whom I suspect has high hopes that Turner will give him real support, and not merely uh, tongue-in-cheek support, when the provincial election comes in BC. Later in the morning, to continue our function, despite Dr. McGeer of reporting what happens, we shall be interviewing Terry Segerty, the Labour Minister in the Social Credit Government, on some major changes and appointments in the Workman's Workers' Compensation Board system. But first, it's the perils of Pauline, Peter Pauline, and the Lees after the break. Yeah, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Little lady in Victoria. Okay, Jim. The taxidermist, the taxidermist hey, said, would you like them? Uh, would you like, like, uh, would you like to move? And she said, no, no, we're just holding hands. <laughs> Well, 
Politics is entertainment. Gracie Bell. Okay. Okay, right? You've always been a rebel. Don't go that No, I'm not going to go. Jeez, McGeer, Gardam, Curtis. Huh? Oh, no, 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 oh, no. Art, Art, Art may very well be the only liberal in the Liberal Party. Okay. I was the only man in recorded <laughs> history who met Okay, Ronnie. Thank you. Mr. Lee, talk again. Yeah. Hello, how are you this morning? I'm sitting beside Graham Lee. The three party leaders here have one thing which is obviously in common. That is the fact that they are dedicated to defeat social credit and or the NDP. So therefore, gentlemen, I'm not going to give you any cues, but why don't you know, there's barely a smidgen of political difference between the three of you, the ex-NDP, the formal liberal, and the conservative. Why don't you just get together and, and form a middle-of-the-road party and see what happens? Well, I at one time offered uh, Graham and I to join forces. Uh, Graham decided not to, uh, and for very good reasons. I respect his decision. But I must say, there is quite a bit of difference between a liberal philosophy and a conservative philosophy. You've got to believe it. How much do I have to believe it? In actual fact, there's not a smidgen of difference oh, absolutely, really, absolutely, on a provincial basis. Absolutely, there is. Uh, the, the Conservative Party of the province is uh, dedicated to traditional values. It's dedicated to enhancing the family as a basic unit of society. It's very committed to free enterprise. The liberals aren't. Uh, and Mulroney is your god. Well, no, Mulroney's not my god, but he's trying. I think Wilson is doing a commendable job trying to get the... Uh, the trying to get Mulroney to agree with him. The trying to get the finances of the country under control after, what, uh, 20 years of uh, liberal desecration. Uh. So you really feel there's a big political difference? In other words, you'd rather dissipate your forces in these philosophical differences than tackle your major enemy social credit. Am I right, gentlemen? No, I didn't say that. I'm saying that there is quite a fundamental difference in the philosophy, philosophy between the liberals and conservative. And I had, Graham and I had talked about it at one point in time, but for Graham, for very good reasons, chose not to join. Why do you choose to be a maverick on the outside with no possible hope of establishing an effective party or taking power? I think we should get together. He, he's a conservative. I, I think we should get together. I don't think that there may be some difference between liberal and conservative philosophy going back, but I don't believe there's any difference to speak of between Peter, Paul, and Art Lee and Graham Lee. I think that we all fall within the same philosophical boundaries. Uh, now, why, why? Except that you'd have to be the leader of the party. No, not baloney, baloney. I think the important thing is to form a common sense government in this province, and I don't care who the leader is, I want to be part of the team though. Uh, being leader of it isn't necessarily the end all. In fact, uh, having worked around a few leaders in my life, I think the greatest thing would be to follow the leader. It's a much easier life. Now, but just a minute. On the question of federal support, you see, he uh, at least is out in the open. He's a one-man band. You've got a couple of dozen members in your party. We've got more than that. But I'm, but I'm going to tell you that when you say there's no difference between a liberal and uh, a conservative, uh, there may be, but, you, but it's not observable when you watch how those federal governments work. And it's not observable because it doesn't matter whether you're Ed Broadbent, John Turner, or Brian Mulroney. Once you get into federal power, Central Canada tells you what to do. Ah. Uh, that's, what, that's what happens. You know perfectly well that the Conservative Party in British Columbia has not only been neglected by those in Ottawa, but your, your face has been trampled with a hard iron heel because they tell Bennett, we're going to support you in the next election. We will not help our provincial party, don't they? No, that, that's, that's nonsense. That, that was uh, the case uh, in the past. Uh, a lot of uh, people cried uh, that way, but I can't see that the uh, Conservative Party of Alberta or the Conservative Party of Saskatchewan uh, uh, were sustained uh, by uh, the federal Conservatives. Uh, if the Conservatives of the province of British Columbia have any weaknesses or any shortcomings, it's, it's because of ourselves, not because of the federal Conservatives. And now, you're hoping that John, Tur John Turner has been very outspoken in the anti-social credit, hasn't not, he? Not lately. Not no, lately. No, just a moment. <laughs> he has been, and he will be there. I have a fundraising function at which he will be here, and he's coming to our convention uh, March 7th, 8th, and that's the major distinction between my party and, for example, the Conservative Party, that it is much easier to go back to a traditional philosophy of liberal and conservative. Graham has a very tough, difficult job putting forward a brand new party. At least people know 
generally what a liberal philosophy is or a conservative philosophy is all about. But Mr. Turner will be there, and that's the major distinction between us and the Progressive Conservative Party. But you're kind of pathetic. How many candidates did you run in the last provincial election? We ran pretty well a full slate. So far, we've nominated 12, Jack. Uh, but on the 12 full... candidates to date, we've nominated 12. I'm impressed, I'm impressed, I'm impressed. But when you ran your full slate, what percentage of the total vote did you get? 3%. 3%? How many candidates did you run in the last election? Couldn't tell you. I think it's about 17. About 17. And you probably got <coughs> zilch percent. Well, we got 5.7. 5.7? Well, I think we, in the central Fraser Valley, we got 13% in, in one uh, constituency. Well, but but what, you're just talking numbers, Jack. The, the significance of saying how what percent we got. Well, uh, what percent did the Conservatives get before Lougheed in Alberta? They, they didn't have a, have a candidate. Uh, our uh, uh, contention isn't that we've got to stop playing the polls. We've got to get give some people, give the population some ideas and some ideals and something to believe in. The flim flam, the gracie glitter domes and lighting up bridges and uh, uh, politics as entertainment and that you're one of the advocates of that has got to stop in this province. We've got to get to the point where we're, we're defining our problems and, and having solutions. <laughs> Do you think it's any fun sitting here some days talking to politicians of all stripes Be and terrible. trying to get entertainment out of the politicians? <laughs> it, it, McGeer is the only one that gives us a laugh. It, it, it might be just a bit different if the media quit trying to get laughs, trying to make politics the other game other than the <laughs> NHL, and talked about the very serious issues that face us in this province. If we're always going to talk about what did you get in the last election, how many candidates have you got, how, are how your many ratings? numbers have how you got. How are your ratings? Oh, yeah, that's the same Are your battle. ratings good? It's, it's, are your ratings it's, it's good? A, and, it's, and it's silly. We have some very serious issues in this province. <laughs> and mainly, wow. and mainly, all the media wants to cover are the game of politics. Uh, I'm not saying that conflict of interest isn't important. It is. However, what is more important is where is the economy going in this yeah, province? Absolutely. Uh, you know, because we will have no art, we'll have no culture, we'll have none of it unless we have a generation of wealth to pay for it. Well, I must admit you've hit the point that it is kind of dull because it's so difficult to find any difference, for instance, between the philosophy of any one of the three of you. No, the difficulty You're all is for the welfare state. The, the, the no, difficulty is you don't well, listen. I'm not, you see. <laughs> you never ask. I think the welfare state has run its course. I think that if you go to federal politics, you'll find that the conservatives, the NDP, and the liberals are all proponents of the welfare state. That's how far they are behind. You're talking about differences. I think that there are quite substantial differences. But certainly the impressions, because the media and the people don't really have an opportunity to say us three. But I think what's very clear, and that's the reason why all three of us are here and why I'm involved in this political process, that people want non-confrontational and confident government and they just don't get it from the Socrates and they are very skeptical of getting it from the NDP and that's why I'm involved in this political process uh, and I think it's I think it's fair I mean I think I would like to spend some time here this morning talking about employment the economy education and all of the issues that I think affect the province of British Columbia and you will see the differences I think between uh, three I've debated at the same time while you sit here being ponderous and responsible you watch with your three. ratings go down <laughs> There's a grave danger of that with you three gentlemen. But you watch with glee when we interview uh, Jim Nielsen or do a story on McClellan or talk about conflict of interest. There's no glee there. There's, There's no sadness. glee there. Uh, that, that's, sadness. that's right. As a matter of fact, I think the media acted pretty irresponsibly in the case of Jim Nielsen. Uh, I just think it was terrible that they sent a camera crew out to talk to his wife and hounded his wife. He uh, didn't hound his wife. All baloney. You, got, right you, you guys hounded his wife. Nonsense. And, uh, Absolute and I thought nonsense. It was, and I thought it was silly. And if I may say so, bunkum. <laughs> After the break. Okay, we're going to have some more shooting of the messenger this morning, but I'm going to give them a chance to tell me something different or impressive about their political philosophies, which will help... Uh, post-expo to bring British Columbia back into the full mainstream of jobs and industry. In okay. Fifteen seconds or less? Spellbind me. If you're good enough, you can go on all morning. Spellbind. Well, what I would do uh, if I were uh, in charge of this uh, plan, I would assess what's wrong with it, and you've got to look at your major industries in the province. The forest industry is a basket case. The mining industry is a basket case. Farming is a problem. Uh, fishing has got potential, but it's not being fully uh, exploited. Now, let's get to the forestry industry very briefly. Uh, we are cutting more than we're, uh, 
when we're, when we're planning, we're not putting enough back into forestry and we're taxing the hell out of forestry in the, in the, in the form of water taxes and capital taxes, energy taxes. The same as the mining, mining industry. Here we've got Cominco that's going down the drain, and we've, moved, we've, we've, the drain. Moved, we've moved the taxes on water alone in, at Cominco from a million a few years ago to 12 million last year. Well, and and I you can can't continue to tax industries that you depend upon. Well, just, uh, would you therefore go <laughs> ahead with the Carney plan if you were the Premier of BC and put up $12 million to buy preferred shares in Cominco with the 69 million federal money? so that they can do the $270 million modernization of the lead smelter. Would yes, you put that up? Absolutely. You're a Tory. Sure. And you'd private, you'd invest in CPR's coming. CP, uh, uh, preferred, yeah, preferred stock. Absolutely. But don't forget, we've taken out millions and millions of dollars in the last decade. Why not put uh, a little in? But I would uh, do it on a very, very disciplined uh, a basis. In other words, we would take the preferred stock and it would become a debt against Cominco. I, I don't believe in these gifts to, to major corporations. Well, equal time requires that I chop you off there and say, you impressed me with an economic philosophy that would help British Columbia because you can't blame Bennett for the collapse of the forest uh, lumber trade or the mining industry because of world prices. It, it didn't collapse. The forest industry hasn't collapsed. That's a myth. The, the prices have gone down. We've sh we're shipping more lumber to the United States and to the world than we've ever shipped in our How many fewer people are working in the forest industry in BC? Because, we, because we're getting more efficient, and we've got to get more efficient to retain that employment. First and foremost, you've got to get rid of the non-confrontation. I mean, even the government's own reports indicate that it's stopping investment from coming into the province here. Let's talk about Cominco as an example. The government talks about all of these mines, and they appointed a very good liberal, Art Phillips, to head up the Commissioner for Critical Industries. But there would be six mines still open today if it wasn't for the water tax rate levy. Cominco and its operations in 1980 paid $100,000. Right now, they're paying about $11 million. There's some 6,000 jobs at stake. We have surplus hydroelectric power, Jack, in, in Revelstoke. And yet, you know, now the Premier now wants to talk about building another big dam and we're going to export it to the state. But the water tax has got nothing to do with power, as you well know. The water tax was merely a device to collect more money for general revenue. Sure. And before, it the did sure. And before the Fed's got it. And, and the point that I'm trying to make here is that we have, and BC Hydro has a mammoth debt. That is how we get the return on our debt. Who's going to buy a dam? Let's return it to the province of British Columbia. Help the industries that are here. You talked about the forestry and mining. The premier of this province, yes, it's true that a lot of it's not due to his own fault, but he has made the situation much worse than he has. And the best example of that is the water rate levy. We have a very competitive edge on hydroelectric power. We do not take the best advantage of it. But you certainly wouldn't build Site C Dam on a, on a long term contract for the Americanos unless it was a gilt edge contract that paid for the cost of the dam, would you? 50% exactly. markup. Exactly. How much? And, and a 50% markup. And don't forget the price of natural gas is dropping all the time in the United States, too. Youth unemployment. One of the real problems, under 25 unemployment in British Columbia today is disastrous. Well, unemployment is going to be the problem, and Peter put his, uh, his finger on it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that during the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, when you brought new investment into this province and invested either in the infrastructure or the old industries that we have, uh, that new investment created new wealth and with it new jobs. Today we have exactly the opposite happening. New investment in our infrastructure, new investment in our old industries creates unemployment because we become more productive. The problem is we don't have any other economy going on that will take up the slack of those people who are losing their jobs in the, in the old industries. In 1979, we had a bumper year for forest products, output of forest products. 1984, we had 10% higher volume output of forest products, and we did it with 25% fewer people. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. no, I don't remember. McMillan Blodell, 40% of the, you know, that's, that, that's a big one. Uh, the grain elevator in Prince Rupert, $500 million, because we needed a new grain elevator because we have to move our grain cheaper to market, to international market. There's no doubt we have to make these investments to modernize our industry, our infrastructure, but we have to understand that those new investments are creating unemployment rather than wealth and uh, uh, employment. Northeast Coal, for instance. Northeast Coal is a different, uh, it's, it's a new project. Uh, it leave it, taking Northeast Coal and not relating it to Southeast Coal, if you just take Northeast Coal, you'd have to say all the, new, all the jobs yeah. there are new. Uh, but that may not be true in the aggregate. Okay, let's change, you see. Uh, public inter interest demands that I switch you from topic to topic. Indian land claims. 
well, Indian land claims have to be negotiated. Uh, you know, I met with the mining industry uh, not that long ago, and at the top of the mining industry's priority was let's negotiate the land claims. You know why? Because there's investment not coming into this province because the land claims are not negotiated. Indian land claims. Well, we've been advocating that we should sit down with the, uh, the Indians and, and negotiate uh, for years. Uh, the idea of uh, ignoring the situation, uh, that's the policy of the so creds, uh, that it might go away isn't, uh, isn't the right thing to do. I'm not for giving the province back to the Indians. Uh, uh, not Stanley Park. North Stanley Park. As a matter of fact, I think what we need is some integrity and some strength and some courage to go out and, and, and uh, have discussions with the federal government, with the Indians, and resolve this problem. I don't think it's an easy problem to resolve, but it certainly has to be faced up to. The new charter, of course, put the Indian land claims into the courts for a thousand years. Existing Aboriginal rights. That's correct. Whatever that's those the one are. That's going, whatever they are, and nobody knows and what they are, and you Liberals didn't have guts enough to spell them out. No, that was largely at the insistence of the Assembly of First Nations, but I believe that you must negotiate. I mean, the, the way that the government operates, it's much like the ostrich with a head in the sand, but you've got to remember that your back end is still exposed. And that's the whole problem with not negotiating in these land claims. A lot of it's Because a lot of it's stopping investment here in the province of British Columbia. I've met mining people as well. But let's go one step further. I think that the other issue that we have to address, the integrity. We have a very good thing going on right now with the Seashell Indian Band, and I just mm -hmm. visited there with what they are trying to do with self-government. In effect, they are saying whatever land base they now own, they will get title, that's the reserve, and they will in effect turn that into municipal government to have a control and destiny over what their own lives so that they are not constantly taking good. hands out. And that is something that I think is very positive, and I think that that is something that is really required here in BC, and I think that's the kind of thing we should be looking at. Pick a pick of premiers. Got to go to the phones because oh, you'll get bored stiff if I continue the conversation. Questions to Lee, Lee the Lee brothers, <laughs> not the Smith brothers, and Peter Pollan after the break. Well, admittedly, I, for instance, don't do as much depth in politics as I used to do, partly because the legislature never seems to sit, you know, and it kind of wins you away from it. How long can we carry on with a billion dollars debt, new debt in British Columbia each year? I think the figure quoted was from four billion in '73 to about 19 billion now. That's right, that's and, the, and the debt is going to swallow the economy of, of the province if we don't come to grips with it. You see, we, we're always talking about the federal debt. The provincial debt, which is rising rapidly, is a much more frightening debt than a federal debt. Ninety-five percent of the federal debt is owed to Canadians. That's people who buy savings bonds, uh, companies who invest. But provincial debt is ninety-five percent owed to outside interests out of this province, to the bankers and the financiers. And that's a much more frightening debt. And much than of it in American funds, too. Oh, I'd say Most half. of it. Well, about 65%. But, uh, to take BC Hydro, as an example, it has a deficit of about $8 billion. Over half of that debt of their operating goes to servicing the debt, and half of that is, is an American fund. So every time, you know, when the Canadian dollar unfortunately goes down, we've got to pay more. So that's why I keep on coming back to saying we're fritting away that very competitive advantage. And how you get that return is by helping your industries. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't go after the globe trotting industries. You look after your forestry and you look after well, your mining industries. Bennett here. has tried that. Bennett gives uh, BCDC gives, gives a loan of $25 million to that wafer board plant up in Dawson Creek. I think that's the kind of thing you would all do, isn't it? No. no. No, no, what you have to do is you have to get the money that's in savings and therefore investment to the creativity of the entrepreneurs, not the bureaucrats of government or the bureaucrats of big corporations, because the creativity from the entrepreneur is going to be where the future lies. An educated entrepreneur 
And that's where our economic future is going to lie. It's not subsidizing bureaucrats either privately or in the, in the public domain. Well, I must admit, you guys have got to be admired and respected for the very fact that you're in the political arena. How difficult is it for you to get, I mean, be honest with you, you can certainly be blunt about it, a credible candidates from, say, business and, and academia to run for a political party? Is it the fault of the media that the people don't seem to appear to run? I, I think the media, and I talked to Marjorie Nichols about this yesterday, creates an environment where, where the media indicts all uh, politicians. In, in this province, if you're a politician, you're a suspect. And if you don't change that, if we don't, as a community, don't change that uh, uh, concept, that view of politicians, we're dead. Uh, you look at the House, the members in the House. Indeed, our, our, the average member of Parliament that we send from B.C. to Ottawa, I think it was Trudeau who said, five miles from home, nobody knows the guy. We do not send... Five miles from Ottawa, they are nobody. That's, okay, the, the, the problem that we have is that we're not getting the best uh, qualified people into the political process. Where are the university professors? Where are the small businessmen, the big businessmen, the labor union leaders, the broadcast? Well, we got enough broadcasters. No, all kinds <laughs> of broadcasters. <laughs> Uh, do, do you have the same complaint about the lack of the proper potential for candidates? I, I happen to agree that there is that concern there, but what is happening with us, we've nominated 12 today. You're finding, okay, they may not necessarily be stars, but we are nominating doctors and lawyers and business people and people from academia because they're very concerned with what's going on here in the province of British Columbia, and they're prepared to take you know, the flack, uh, if, if one wants to call that, from people like yourselves or from other people within the media. But or I if they're embarrassing the government, they must be prepared to take the flight from the media itself. Ex I mean, as I said to another person, don't shoot the, the messenger. We're not expected to keep our heads down and ignore anything that embarrasses any government. No, but you have a responsibility, and, you, and you, you've been derelict in, in assuming your responsibilities, and a perfect example of that is the, uh, the Full Disclosure Act. Uh, Waterland declared that he owned Western Forest Products shares. It was on his declaration for two years. And you lazy group of characters missed and, and it. Missed it. And, and you were part of the political process. And yet none of you were chastised, reprimanded, the war sackcloth. I didn't see you we saying I apologize. That. Matter of fact, I was embarrassed over a certain aspect of that particular thing myself, even though I didn't need to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the embarrassment was buying it and losing your shirt. That's <laughs> <laughs> it is tough getting candidates. Because but on the other hand, uh, I want to get back mm. to this. Uh, surely to goodness, we were perhaps a little bit uh, naive, but when the Premier of a province is presumed to have set up the proper rules... Nonsense. You we don't shouldn't say, have to go around and snipe everybody all the time. You don't set up proper rules to be moral, to be uh, You do for conflict of interest. No, you yes, don't. You do. Anybody knows when they're in conflict Red of interest. Registrar and Ottawa goes through their assets and says you can keep that and get, get rid of that. <sighs> but, well, that's the whole purpose of the blind trust is in order yeah. to attract, say, the industrialist type person uh, who blind, may have a lot of asset holdings in. Blind but Brian, blind trust, what the, what's a well, how, blind trust? Well, how are you going to, are you going to suggest that a man who, of means should never be able to run for public no, life? No, you no, just don't blind, play the stock market but, when you're in public But life. a blind trust hides what you have. Sure. I'd say better to do it like the British system, you put it all on the table. Everything that you own, everything that you're involved in, you put it on the table so that the decisions that you make can be judged against what you're holding. But that, that's the system we now have, and it's not working. No, that, <laughs> no, that, no, that it works, it works perfectly we well. It works perfectly okay, well okay. if the press will look at it and people will, will look at the, the financial disclosure. I'm exhausted. Pick a pack of premiums after the break. Go ahead to any one of these potential premiers. Yes, um, I noticed the Conservatives candidate was speaking on uh, giving tax cuts to industries as an incentive to stabilize our industries. Well, if they're going to do this, then how are they going to be paying for social services within the province? Are they going to up personalize taxes more in the province, or what will they be doing? And after I hear the reply, I have another question. Go on. Well, certainly, I mean, this, is, uh, this is the welfare state question. Certainly, uh, you're going to have to have revenue to pay for all the social welfare and all the expenses of the government. So that's a given. I haven't suggested reducing sales tax, although I'd like to. We have to have a sales tax for revenue. But there's no use taxing an industry that is virtually going broke, namely the mining industry or the forest industry. You can't tax a company that's not making any money. We're doing that now, and we're just accelerating their bankruptcy. 
The welfare state, what do you say when you say you're not for the welfare state? Well, I think what we have to do is take a look, a look at a different form of redistribution of wealth in our society. Uh, rather than the government collecting taxes from those who have and giving it to people who haven't, uh, I would much rather see the people of this country and the people of this province become owners of capital goods. We have to move the average citizen from just being a labor wage earner, but to a person who's also making money and earning wages by owning capital stock. It's a Kelso plan. Oh, Louis Kelso. What's that? It's a Kelso plan. Louis Kelso. Uh, but How long would that take, said Webster, the not, shop? Not very long. 5,000 companies in the States are doing the Kelso plan right now and very successful. This is share participation. Oh, I know what you mean, but aren't most of our people too big to go into share participation? Oh, no, I think it's something that's going to have to come. We're doing it now, in effect, I mean, through large pension funds who own uh, many of, say, the top 500 that's listed in Fortune. But in answer directly to this question, I, clearly that's the reason why the Liberal Party got defeated last, uh, in the last general federal election. We as a party now have got to spend, and we are spending more time, with the issues of how you create wealth rather than just the distribution of wealth. Obviously, you've got to have money to spend money. And that's why I, as the provincial leader, have advocated an independent business bond to help the small business sector. Independent what? An independent business bond. Do you want me to bond. spend a moment or two on it? One moment. Well, I'd, All right. like, I'd like to ask Art how he's going to finance it, because he's already given up $1.5 billion of revenue in the first year by, by liberal policy in this province. Uh, you're giving up sales tax. There's a moratorium on sales tax for one year. That's one and a half billion dollars. I've watched your other figures where you're going to spend a further half, and, uh, half uh, a billion dollars on education, forestate, reforestation. You're down two billion in revenue before you start. Is this a bond <laughs> plan? No, 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 I don't. I'll come back if I can answer all of that. But I'll, let me just talk about the independent business. Hold up for a moment. Let's get his second question. Go ahead, Carl. Okay, uh, that proved interesting. The other thing that I'm wondering, I've got another two questions. You get one more. Okay, uh, the one thing is, is if they're going to encourage business, what are they going to do to, or how are they going to encourage the business in the province to get management and labor to work together instead of having them at each other's throats? Well, uh, th th that's uh, very, uh, very basic, and that is to make the employees uh, part of uh, business and part of the management process. This is a Kelso plan where you get uh, employees having an opportunity to buy shares in the company. Uh, incentives are built in, uh, and they get paid a percentage of the increased productivity. Uh, there must be a, a, a coming together. Uh, the coming together success stories of the world are Sweden, Switzerland, Japan. Uh, but, but the, the confrontation has got to stop, but you're not going to stop it by having the government play on it. The government right now are playing the BCGEU against the population, the teachers against the population, the civil servants against the population. And we ain't come to the building trade yet or to pulp or to the IWA for we, the summer. You, the main ingredient you're going to have to have, no matter what cooperative route that you go in, you're going to have to have trust between the three parties, Absolutely. labor, business, and, and government. And right now, I can't foresee the day when the trade union leaders would sit down with the social credit government with a feeling of trust, I can't see the industrial section of this province sitting down with the NDP with a feeling of trust. I believe a new government is needed so that there can be the beginning of that trust. But on your independent bond, you cannot go in in the state of our uh, finances, surely, and sacrifice a couple of billion dollars from revenue and still maintain your social safety nets of all the schemes. Well, he, he mentioned one part of the plank, and that was with respect to sales tax. And that was during a period when retail sales were declining. We've abandoned that. We would like to phase out the reduction of, of sales tax because it's gone from 7 to 5 percent. Mr. Graham Lee sits there and he says he criticized. I haven't heard any specific proposals come from him. Let's talk about the independent business bond. You and I right now, Jack, have a lot of savings in our banks. We have about three billion here in the province of British Columbia. What we're saying is that we would register in those bonds. The government, the provincial government would forgo its provincial income tax on that bond. They would be loaned out in the normal way to small businesses and medium-sized businesses here in the province of British Columbia. Half of that loan would be guaranteed by the government. The other half would be at the risk of the financial institution. So they're going to ensure it's a good investment. That's and what right. they're going to say, the, what they're going to say is that think of the opportunities. And this is, I've talked to people in the brokerage business, I've talked to people in the money business, and they say it can work. And it's, and it's far better than the venture capital system that the provincial government talks about because what, what are you doing there? It's really helping the middleman or even that stock uh, giveaway stock program. A terrible great. giveaway of $2,500. Well, that's, that's great for the brokers. Now, the cost? 
of that 500 million, Graham was right about that, the 500 million package, for 30 million dollars we can create a pool of capital of 600 million. The cost of the stock equity program of the provincial government is 100 million dollars and that's got to come directly out of general revenues. And who does it hurt? Not only does it hurt programs for social housing or education, but it also even hurts programs to help business people here in the province of British Columbia. What do you say to the independent bond plan? What oh, do you say there's uh, a tax-free provincial independent bond plan like they have tax-free municipal bonds in the states, is that right? Well, yeah, but the, the tax-free municipal bonds are for a very specific purpose in the United States. That's to finance schools and municipal works. Art's talking about a, a, a tax-free bond to encourage business. And again, I think this is a good example of the difference between a, a conservative and a liberal. Uh, to me, that is just funny money. Uh, you're shuffling the, the deck chairs in the Titanic in many ways. That's what, my what, 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 what you've <laughs> got to, but what you've got to address yourself to is the realization that there's adequate capital in the major banks of Canada, adequate capital. Uh, so there isn't any shortage of capital. What we're, we're short of is, is, is managerial expertise in this province, not only in government but in, in business. But, but we're also short of something else. We're, we're, we're very quickly getting to the situation that they found themselves in uh, in North America during the Depression of, of the 30s. There's a big pool of capital out there, but nobody, when you go to the lenders, is credit worthy. Oh, no, no I, I don't yeah, agree. Yeah. Graham, I don't agree. Anyone that's got a project in this province that is, that is, is viable, that is, is backed by people of integrity. Let me just finish now. Risk money. The, the, there is lots of risk money out there. Matter of fact, the Liberal government set up this research and development program just before Lalonde and his crowd got blown away, and they have gone through... The, the federal government, $3.5 billion in risk capital in research development. And all, I gather a lot all, of it has gone the wrong way. All dumped, uh, by, much of it dumped by SO Resources to avoid their taxes. I think the one the scoundrel corporation in Canada is SO, what they have done to dump all this this tax uh, avoidance scheme into the public domain. $3.5 billion, let me just finish here. And most of it, about $2.5 billion of the $3.5 billion is not recovered. Now, what I'm saying here is a, is a liberal scheme to, to give incentive to industry that really didn't need incentive. It just needed good banking accounts. Well, that's the sale of the tax credit. The sale of the tax credit. And in, in Victoria alone, one man went through $58 million, and we have nothing to show for it except seven desks and two computers at well, an auction. Obviously, you're not endorsing that scheme. Nobody I, unquestionably. Exactly. That's and, and that's why I say government should stay out of, of this type of area. What they should do is get taxes down so the independent businessman, when he makes a buck, can put money back in the we're going to go through a period of adjustment which will be agonizing for those who are presently poor and getting poorer by the day. Okay, yes. and, but there's only one way to save right. them and that's through a wholesome healthy economy. That's right. But that's but we're going to have this period of readjustment whether no it's question. free trade or dropping but revenues but or whatever. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a proponent of free trade. Uh, I realize though that by going the, the free trade route that there's going to be great moments of hardship. Okay. But, it, but it's either do that or commit suicide the slow way. Hold on, but, but please. Unquestionably, we, we've talked about this, and certainly the Liberal government made a mistake. Mr. Monroney's making the same mistake with his $500,000 lifetime tax exemption from capital gains. Well, but I haven't, heard either of you, I haven't heard either of you talk about a program that's going to help small business. If you're in small business or medium-sized business, and you should know that, Peter, well, capital gains, how uh, does one get a loan today? We've got all kinds of money in our institutions here in the province of British Columbia. Look, when I was traveling abroad, I ran into a banker from the United States, and I asked him, why don't you invest here in Canada? And he says, well, our own banks don't invest here. So we have got to get those funds. Hold it. After the break. <laughs> ...staff and uh, not incurring too much expense. We also received some concerns from the constituents of interest with respect to the reporter series, uh, another uh, 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 area of record that the parties of interest use for establishing uh, uh, claims and uh, precedent setting uh, practices and so on. Mr. Hall will be reporting to you on it again in, in a couple of minutes. I also received some concerns from the constituents of interest with respect to the way the regional offices operating throughout the interior of British Columbia the respond to customer service. And when I say customer service, largely to do with the way they respond to injured workers when uh, they go into the office 
uh, in a situation where they've just uh, been injured, uh, are now out of work, uh, what services are there available to respond uh, to those individuals? And in the area too pertaining to the small business community, a lot of uh, concerns with respect to that. And uh, I'll ask Mr. Hall to, uh, to comment on that in a couple of minutes also. Uh, See, the problem when you do a fairly lengthy and fairly serious interview, you can't get to the phones to find out what ordinary people think. So when I, put I want to punch everybody who's holding on just now up briefly to tell me what they think of these people. I've got to get some life back in the progress. I'm sure, Biz. Is there life after death? Is there life after politics? Go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, Jack. Uh, what do you think of them? Are you talking to me, Jack? Yeah. Um, well, I'm, uh, I hear Peter Pollan and uh, Art Lee telling us that, uh, you know, they're different. They're not like the Socrates. We've heard this song before from uh, these two parties, and uh, we've seen in the past that when push came to shove, uh, their people have taken to the Socrates like ducks to water. Uh, I'm a little concerned that uh, if these two people should get in and we're in a minority government situation, that, uh, you know, we won't need to guess too hard where these two guys are going because we've seen in the past where they've gone. And you've already pointed out a very cozy uh, mm. relationship with the federal libs and the Tories. I'm a little concerned. What uh, assurances do we have that these people have more integrity than the members in the past? At least Graham Lee has the decency to say, I don't believe, agree with any of them, and I'm going to sit as an independent. Good comment. No questions. I don't want questions just now. I just want comments. Go ahead from Courtney. Okay, here's a comment. The grain elevator in Prince Super is supposedly going to shut down to lay off union employees and rehire non-union employees to save in 20 years the amount of money that they would have paid out for the extra wages. That's just a comment. You mean that you've had that somewhere? No. Yes, in Prince no, Super. Is it true? No. no it's Lee not. says it's not true. No, it's, it's, it's a unionized shop and will remain that. Will remain unionized? Roger. Okay, thank you. Roger. Comment I'm looking for. Go ahead, please. Okay, I have uh, a couple of com questions here, I'll turn it to comment. Will they consider uh, either trying to woo existing members of the legislature to their own parties, or would they consider not running member, uh, candidates directly against each other uh, in various writings, trying to uh, cut up the problems between them for a coalition government? Good question. I don't think uh, we need any coalitions. Historically, coalitions have been a disaster. It's a compromise of ideas and ideals. Yes, we are, as a Conservative Party of the province, wooing members of the legislature. Uh, I'm currently wooing Graham Lee, and I wish he'd join us. Uh, we need that kind of dynamics in the, pro in the, in the party. But no coalition. How That's about right. you? No coalitions. No, he had another question. What was it? We should have a coalition of like-minded people. There's nothing wrong ideas. with that. An idea. Oh, sure. A common sense party. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, first of all, um, to Mr. Lee of the United Party, um, my initial uh, reaction to him is that he's sort of a political Don Quixote. Mm -hmm. And there are four established so. parties with uh, quite substantial histories behind them in this province. And I think that if I were him, I would probably try to work within the structure of one of them, have them adopt his agenda rather than uh, go on this crusade to start a fifth party. Uh, to Mr. Paulman, my comment is that uh, for instance, he, he made a comment about increasing productivity through tech change as the sort of uh, activity the government should encourage. Um, he makes no allowance in that for displacement of undereducated and dispossessed poor people. To me, that's typical of the dodgy dog philosophy of the Conservative Party. And to Art Lee? <laughs> Art Lee, um, I, pretty reasonable. Um, I think that the Liberal Party uh, has a very lengthy history of being progressive, of uh, supporting the dispossessed people in the country. Um, the forefathers of the Liberal Party died and spilled their blood uh, for freedom in this country. I guess not a lot of people know that. And uh, I think that everything I've heard uh, Mr. Lee say in the papers these days and on the on the uh, television media sounds pretty reasonable. Okay, put your down as a liberal. Go ahead, please. <laughs> yes, good morning. Uh, Jack? Yes, your comment. I'd like to put a few facts on the table. First of all, they were, you were saying that we had a $19 billion debt for British Columbia. I think if you were checking it out very closely, you'd find that we have a $3 billion operating debt. $3 billion operating, plus an $8 or $8.5 billion crown corporation. The federal debt is $220 billion now operating. $220 billion. Biggest per capita in the world. 
and $60 billion Crown Corporation debt. So let's not get the figures mixed up, Jack. And well, I'm figures. sorry. I'm sorry I was right in my figures. The BC of, figures oh. are right. What are the BC figures of debt in the province? Four and seventy-five of 18 and 19 today. No, it's yeah. three billion operating debt. Well, no, the operating debt is a billion dollars. And eight billion Crown Corporation. Yeah, the, that's right. Okay, now, furthermore, Jack, if these gentlemen would look at interest rates, there's a, there's a prime thing that's causing our problems in, in British Columbia or Canada. Interest rates, if they were steady, people could count on them staying down. You would see business really being created again. Immigration is a federal thing. It's not provincial. Monetary system is federal. It's not provincial. Export and import is all federal. That's what you say. Please. What are you saying? We know that. We're not stupid. Okay, well, then you cannot... Uh, these people go way beyond their mandate when they talk about all these things. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, he's got a good point. the only one that talks about these factual things sometimes. Well, no, there's one thing that this gentleman is... You know, he talks about the Crown Corporation debts. Under our bookkeeping system, it's what they call a contingent liability. If BC Hydro goes down the tube, it's the BC taxpayer who ends up paying for it. Well, we know that, Art. He's, he's got a point. Uh, and the point is this, that when politicians of the, pr the provincial level tend to talk about the economy of the province, they somehow leave the impression, and all of us, I think, that we have the kind of levers available to us to do n a number of economic things, when in fact, we are a province in a nation state and don't have some of the levers that it would be nice to have, such as interest rates, yeah, but tariffs. This, 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 but that's why you need a federal party as well, and that's the difficulty with look your at, party. Look, let me you do, no, just a I moment. Did, you do not have a federal wing of your party. That is I am a liberal thing. here in the province of British Columbia. I'm also a liberal here in Ottawa, and we are going through this well, period you just of lost, reform. You just lost my vote, Art. No, Peter I was, Paul, I was going to vote for you, and I heard you were tangled up with the federal liberal. No, Peter Paul and <laughs> you know, federal <laughs> people have disowned and we are going through the process of reform, and John Turner is a member of Parliament from British Columbia. Yes. I, I think there's so much money going Sorry, Jack. Yeah, go on. Last point from you. Okay, one more point. If I was supporting Bill Bennett, I'd support Graham Lee. He's the only one with the brains there. Thank you. Go ahead from Prince George. That's you. No. Morning, Jack. Uh, Morning. My comment is a lot to do with the ethics and credibility of politicians in general. Uh, first of all, I don't, I've never seen one politician from one party compliment or acknowledge something that was done by another political party that actually achieved something. They're all so busy finding some negative way to knock the other party, slam them down, that the people out here around where I live and anywhere I've been just refuse to accept anything that they say after a while, and then you end up with this big shortage of people turning out to vote when it comes uh, time to vote for anybody. Well, that, that, that's a, a, a ridiculous assessment to begin with. I mean, as, as some assertions, some statements are made there that just aren't true. Obviously, W.A.C. Bennett and his uh, uh, W.A.C. wacky government uh, did uh, wonderful things. They built the ferry system. They developed the highway system. They developed uh, uh, B.C. Hydro and the B.C. Uh, W.A.C. Bennett Dam. Uh, they kept the, uh, the finances of the province well under control. Uh, that, that is a compliment and a good assessment. The, the last uh, uh, Bennett dynasty, the young Bennett, has left uh, the highest unemployment practically in, in, uh, in Canada, an immense debt, uh, uh, a legacy of, of mega projects that are disasters such as Northeastern Coal. Uh, we're, we're, we've got propaganda coming out of the television sets that are hitting our citizens on how wonderful the government is. Now our uh, 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 responsibility as opposition people is to point out to the to the province, the, the people of the province, the crisis that's confronting us, and also some solutions. We've also got break. You forgot about break. break. As most people have. After the I break. Like talking about it. After the break. Well, you should know who they are. Graham Lee, United Party, Art Lee, leader of the Liberal Party, Peter Pollan, leader of the Conservative Party. And we've been taking comments, which should be very satisfactory from the point of view of general interest. Go ahead, please. Yes. My comment is that uh, it's about all three party representatives or, or leaders, and that they, uh, in fact, told you to start with exactly what was wrong with what was going on in the press and in your program, and that, in fact, if the press and your program would stop running around tripping over each other with cameras and microphones looking for dirt and, and mud to sling around that they might find some political uh, philosophers who would join various parties but the only way they can go in, in now is to become activists and on the dole like the NDPers 
and then they can either come in uh, with through the BCTF or the or the uh, unionists. The, the lower mainland is just full of those people who who are unemployed and belong to the uh, used to belong to the unions and would like to run for party because that's the only way that you you can get in there and, and speak your piece. Well, I think that's a fair comment, and thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Good comment. Yeah, good comment. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Good morning. I would have to dub these three gentlemen nonsense, <laughs> no sense, and nonsense. I've never heard such pie-in-the-sky platitudes in all my life. First of all, this is a two-party province. It has always been a two-party province, and the two parties work towards that end. So I'm prepared to bet any one of those gentlemen, any amount they wish, that not one of their um, uh, people will be elected. Well, that might be possibly true. And I'll tell you, I'd rather go down proudly fighting for something I believe in than going along for a ride just because it's available. Thank you. Good. Perfect comment. Reply. Perfect reply. Go oh, ahead. Mr. Webster? Oh, yes, go ahead, please. Uh, can I speak to Peter Pollan? Yes, carry on. Uh, I am... Uh, I want to congratulate P uh, you, Peter, on the, the campaign that you are carrying forward in the organization of the Conservative Party. And I feel quite sure that if we don't uh, be the power in the next election, we will be the balance of power. Now, I'm 76 years old, and I am the man that organized and controlled the uh, campaign in Surrey in the last election. So I congratulate you, Good. and I tell you, we're all behind you, and there's a lot of conservatives we brought out of the woods in Surrey. Did you vote social credit in the last election? No, sir, I voted conservative. Thank you, sir. Thank Go you ahead, please. Thanks for coming. Yes, Mr. Webster. Yes. Uh, I've listened to the three gentlemen, and what we need <coughs> is secondary industry in B.C. I know of two firms that have been came from the States to study to put plants here, and their main topic was a... Our taxes were too high, Absolutely. our energy costs were too high, our union things were too high, and our labor costs are too high, the unions. Then, the gentleman said, well, we don't have trained people, education. Why is it that General Motors uh, is going into the Orient, uh, Chrysler into Mexico, where the people are not educated, but they train them? Those, uh, Korea, China, is getting all major industry because of the cheap labor. And until we wake up with our unions, not bothering with politicians, and go into profit sharing and bonus, we will not get any more jobs here in Canada, and our major industries will slowly peter away because we cannot complete. Couple well, of I, I agree okay. generally with this gentleman's comments. Look, I've been there uh, throughout Southeast Asia, and it's rather interesting that this government, through its 10-year tax-free holiday special economic zones, is trying to attract these footloose industries here. And you have to concentrate on what's already here. We have a very viable forestry industry. We can still have a very viable mining industry, and we certainly can have a viable tourism industry. And education is one of the, the keys in order to get this going. But He's mentioned many other things, there like are lots uh, of people product out there who will regard that as a conservative thread. And here yeah, but let, let, let me emphasize, don't, don't blame l labor. I mean, if you think for one minute uh, a, a North American labor can compete on a wage uh, by wage level with Mexico or Southeast Asia, yeah. you're crazy. The only thing we can do is the first two things. And Taxes that is too high. Re reduce the taxes energy on property. Energy costs too high. Use our cheap energy to, to give them incentive and get labor motivated uh, with good management. And again, you get back to my theme, the, the, the big problem in this province is leadership in business and government and labor. Good, good leadership. Sir, when, when, it, when it comes to taxes, uh, I think we should we have to re-examine the whole tax system. Uh, for instance, I think it's crazy to pay tax. I, I'm against property taxes. I'd like to tax people on their income and tax companies on their profit. How are you going to cover your billion-dollar deficit, though? Oh, well, you have uh, you, you have to say how much money do you have to collect, and you have to collect it in a different way. Absolutely. Go ahead, please. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. I want to thank all three of you for being on the program today. I wish that all three of you would get it together and become one. So we are in a desperate situation. We've got to get rid of Bill and his cohorts. And one other comment would be, we live in a consumer-oriented system. How do you people feel about a conserver-oriented system? Thank you for your time. The natural uh, philosophy of the Conservative Party are conservationists. Uh, I believe uh, s uh, some of our strongest supporters should be and will be the Green Party. I think if you're going to uh, ruin your environment, you might as well virtually give up uh, right now. 
uh, we believe we should conserve energy, we should conserve materials, we should conserve our forest, but at the same time create an environment in which industry can work with labor to create wealth. Kamloops. Good morning, Jack. Uh, I just want to get through some of the stuff that's been going on this morning. Uh, I'm sitting out here and we're, we're developing a company and uh, figured on getting started this spring, but we decided to hold off until the election. Now, if these, if these three clowns uh, manage to split the vote enough for the NDP to get in, we're going to go to Alberta or Washington State. What, what makes you think we'll split the vote that way? Uh, you know, that's, that, that's the old threat. You know, every but time there's you a have no You have no hope of uh, gaining power, look, and if you take enough of the free enterprise vote, you're dead. Look up. You know what's going to be the argument in the next election? The social credit are going to say, we're for free enterprise, and they're not. And the NDP will come along and say, yes, but we like people, and they don't, and both are wrong. That's a very simple argument. The fact of the matter is that you don't have to be a Neanderthal to be free enterprise. The, you can I'd, be a humanist. I'd like to put uh, a question to this gentleman. Wouldn't it be better to have in the legislators some opposition parties which are free enterprise critics? And so we don't end up in a situation it's either them or, or the other people. Well, you, you, get, you, you end up with a social credit and, and your three splinter parties as opposition. And, uh, but what, what do you, what but do you for th one, that there's going to be jobs go to Alberta and Washington. But, but, what, but what do you, let me what ask you, you this you question. Saying? I'm sorry, let me ask you this question. Do you believe that there is, you're getting competent government right now? I, I don't think it's that bad. Uh, I think there has to be a major readjustment of some of the uh, financing in this country, especially in the federal. And... Uh, I don't know the cost of uh, government is a cost of production. Uh, anybody that's in business will tell you that. But are, are the cost you of government is so high in Canada today that you just about have to start looking out for well, it. Well, it, it hasn't been the NDP government that's given us the high cost of government. Uh, it's your, uh, your social credit uh, and liberal parties that have uh, burdened the, uh, the country with incredible uh, government costs. Uh, so what are you talking about? You're really advocating the retention of a government in the province of British Columbia that's virtually bankrupt the province. They're incompetent and now uh, immoral to boot. Now, you, you say to keep the godless socialists from that's the right. gates, we should retain uh, the Bennett dynasty that's, that's virtually right. bankrupting the province. And oh. This is nonsense. Okie dokie. Gentlemen, there I must end a very interesting discussion this morning. It's been uh, bright. Graham Lee, United Party. Art Lee, leader of the Liberal Party. And Peter Paul, leader of the Conservative Party. Who knows when the election will be? Yeah, the Premier does not have to call one until 1988. April. Was. April, if they can clean their, their act up in April the next 30 this year. Day. Absolutely. If they can clean their act up. Not during Expo, though. If, if the millions of dollars they're pumping into commercial television to convince us how wonderful they are work, and they might work, we'll have it in, in April of this year. It's hardly Paul. millions of dollars. All it's of millions. Fall of 86. BCTV's getting their no, share of it, too. No, it's not millions. Don't be... Don't Conflict be of interest. Aesthetically inaccurate show business remarkable. Millions. <laughs> continually <laughs> accuse the media. It's, uh, millions. After the break with Teddy Seconty. Millions. Karen Segerty is the Minister of Labour in Victoria, and as such, of course, he's in charge of the Workers' Compensation Board, a much-criticised organisation which at the moment is headless after the Audi caper. Uh, have you appointed a new chairman to the board yet, Mr Segerty? No, uh, Jack, I haven't appointed a new administrative chairman, but uh, I have uh, uh, got the services of uh, Kevin McBurney of Caldwell & Associates, and uh, my instructions to uh, Kevin is to go out and uh, meet with the uh, parties of interest, the employer and employee community, and to uh, reach uh, consensus with uh, the community on uh, an individual that they would have confidence in over the long period of time uh, with respect to the administration of the Workers' Compensation I've got Board. It. How long do you think that'll take? A couple of weeks or a couple of months, sir? Well, I haven't got a deadline on, uh, on, uh, on the length of time it would take, Jack. I think the process is very important uh, when you're dealing with uh, an employer-employee community, and uh, it's important that we allow the process to work without uh, stringent deadlines and, Good. and time Good, but it periods. seems that at your press conference this morning you made some significant uh, announcements and perhaps have responded quite generously to criticism by doing certain things. First of all, tell me about the Board of Review. Have you appointed a new chairman for it? Yes, uh, Caldwell and Associates uh, did uh, a lot of uh, extensive consultation with the employer and employee community and uh, the uh, community, uh, along with myself, uh, felt that uh, 
uh, uh, Bud Gallagher, uh, the new administrative chairman who has extensive experience in the area of employer-employee relationships would be an excellent candidate. So you've appointed Bud Gallagher from Bud the Gallagher. construction industry and a lawyer to be the new chairman of the Board of Review. That's right. And now, I understand you've backed down in your decision to impose one-man Boards of Review. Well, uh, when uh, we uh, brought Bill 61 into the legislature, Jack, there was some concern with respect to uh, the abuse uh, that might occur from one-member panels. And uh, I've gone around the province. I've had a lot of discussion with the employer and employee community. And uh, one-member panels will only be used where the, uh, the uh, individual Party. making the application requests one-member panels. So that's good. Now, what about this incredible backlog? Did you say this morning that you're going to streamline the backlogs and you'll eliminate the backlog in a month? No, uh, there's, there's, there's two backlogs, Jack. Number one, the, the, we, we're dealing with the issue concerning the Boards of Review, and uh, there's a backlog before the Boards of Review now in, the, uh, in approximately 4,000 people. Uh, we have appointed 10 full-time uh, uh, panels now, three members each, along with uh, four part-time panels. That's the first phase. By the end of March, we will appoint uh, panels in uh, the interior of British Columbia to serve the Kootenay and Cranbrook region, to serve the Kamloops right. uh, and uh, Prince George, and those areas of British Columbia where panels used to move in, in previous days from the coast up into the interior. And uh, we will be appointing uh, and developing that expertise in the interior of British Columbia now under this new process, and they will be appointed uh, at the end of March or thereabouts. So you've got new panels in the interior, extra ones down here, and the 4,000 cases should be wrapped up? Well, I would say 14 months, Jack. In 14 months. Now, you were also criticized heavily for scrapping the reporter series in which the decisions of the board had been published, and also for eliminating transcripts in some of the proceedings. I believe you've changed your mind on those two points too. Well, the, the matter dealing with the transcripts, uh, of course, come under the administration and jurisdiction of the uh, boards of review. Right. And uh, I have, uh, rightly so, uh, received a lot of uh, criticism uh, around the community for eliminating that practice. And uh, we can uh, put that practice back in place now with little cost uh, to the system. Uh, staff in the system can undertake uh, that responsibility. Of course, the chairman of the Workers' Compensation Board, uh, after uh, extensive consultation myself with the community, came back and discussed the matter dealing with the reporter series uh, with the, with the uh, acting chairman of the Workers' Compensation Board, and he himself received a lot of, uh, of uh, input from the community with respect to the reporter series, and uh, the, the acting chairman decided that it would be appropriate to reinstate that service to the employer and employee community in British uh, Columbia. Well, that's good, because without that report to series, many of the union officials couldn't keep up to date with the current decisions of the board. That's right. Now, well, that's, uh, that's something. You've, you haven't found a new chairman yet. You've appointed Bud Gallagher as the new chairman of the Board of Reviews. You're going to have ten full-time uh, uh, review panels, and you're going to have some, some of them appointed in the interior too, including four part-time uh, panels as well, right? That's right, right. You've brought back the transcripts, you've brought back the report to series, you're still looking for Walter Fletcher's replacement, and uh, nobody's going to drive any Audis. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, the other area, Jack, that you didn't mention uh, that uh, we received some criticism from, and that was with, with respect to the administration of the Section 93. Uh, uh, of the uh, Workers' Compensation Act, and that is where, uh, in previous days, the uh, the Boards of Review could make a decision on uh, on uh, an appeal that was before them or a review that was before them. Uh, the local manager could take a look at that review and forward it to the commissioners for uh, further consideration, because uh, uh, the Act said that the commissioners are the only ones that uh, right. could uh, administer policy and set policy. While that is still the case, uh, the uh, acting chairman of the Workers' Compensation Board, uh, acting on the advice from the constituents of interest, plus Bev Cormer, the Labor Commissioner uh, at the Workers' Compensation Board, have now uh, streamlined that process. And uh, uh, the new act, of course, assists them in that uh, regard in many ways. And they won't be reviewing every case now. They will be looking at those cases only that would have an impact on policy 
decisions at the Workers' Compensation Board. So Look, that's the area where that good. backlog should be cleaned I up think, in a month. I think I understand that. And thank you very much, Terry Seger, the Minister of Labor, for coming on and giving me these important changes. Thank you very Thanks, much, Terry. Terry. Next to Free For All, after the break. Yesterday we had a very informative program from my two friends from Revenue Canada, Gilred Dahl and uh, Barbara Toole. After that, however, I think I was responsible for giving out a piece of misinformation on the exact qualifications of what income you can calculate for the purpose of RRSP. So I phoned Gail Riddle right now, she's on the telephone, and I want to ask you a simple question, Gail, for my benefit. It wasn't your information yesterday. If, if my UIC income, I pay income tax on, if my other income brings me above the level for tax payments, does income from UIC become calculable for the purposes of your maximum RRSP contributions? No, Jack, it does not. In no way, shape, or form? In no way, shape, or form. Well, that's just the point I wanted to get, that uh, I was wrong on that yesterday. You weren't here. Uh, UIC contributions, even though I get T4s for them, are not to be calculated for your maximum contribution on RRSPs. Right. Unemployment insurance benefits, which is what you're talking about, unfortunately do not qualify. Good. Supposing I have income from, say, a, a sickness or accident plan, does that qualify? Yes, Jack. That, um, you can have income from um, a sickness indemnity or what is called a supplementary unemployment insurance benefit. Um, the name perhaps is a little bit confusing. It actually is not paid out through the Unemployment Insurance Act. It's, it's a private type plan. And both of those qualify as earned income for our RSPs, but not the unemployment insurance benefits that you receive when you've been laid off from a job and for which you will get a T4U slip for. Gail, thank you very much for clarifying that as ever most lucidly. You're very welcome. Thanks, Gail. Okay. Thanks, Gail. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning. I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on what you thought of the Only in Vancouver live show down at the Arts Club. Well, I got to tell you, I went with um, some of four members of my beloved staff yesterday, and I have not laughed so much in a long while. I thought the takeoff of Harcourt and the hookers... McCarthy. And Grace McCarthy was and fantastic. Grace McCarthy with a little foam... Sky train and, and the girl who does the Grace McCarthy. <coughs> Come on, quick, give me a name. I don't know her name right now. Babs Chula. She looks so much like a caricature of Grace. It's just well, incredible. a friend of mine is in the play, uh, John Payne. He's terrific. They're all terrific. Could you, I just wanted to let you say to, the, to everybody out there that they should get out and support live theater more often. First time I've been to a live review of any kind in the last 10 years, I should imagine. And I strongly recommend that people go and see Only in Vancouver, which is on at the Arts Theatre down in Granville Island, it, which the Arts Review Theatre in Granville Island, and it is a gas. Thank you, Jack. Absolutely wonderful. Worth every nickel. Thank you. Much obliged. Go and see it. And don't forget Linda Boyd, who does this dreadful bit about I want to make love to Jack Webster. I sat there in my modest fashion and blushed furiously. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning, Jack. Good morning. Um, I'd like to comment on the LRT. I uh, <laughs> took my first ride on it a couple of days ago. Yes. And uh, other than the fact that the cabin noise is a bit loud, um, I think it's great. So I do I. Really going to open up New West. In fact, as soon as you get off the uh, station down there, you can see all the sidewalks under construction. Uh, this fantastic new development in New West, the station right at the foot of 8th uh, Street. Mm -hmm. 8th, 8th Street. Yeah, I can see that whole commercial area opening up and stuff. Um, and I don't know why they'd had to apologize for only putting it across the river to Scott uh, Road. Hopefully they'll put it out to Chilliwack one day, and I'd like to see it in the Arbutus line if it can ever be justified. Sure. Oh, I think it's one of the best things ever done on the face of the lower mainland uh, all the time I've been here. And also when they planned it, they planned well ahead for the future because this, uh, the type of cars they're using now is really they easily to change over to a full you, monorail system, say in about 20, 25 years or so. Um, the only other comment I'd like to make is concerns Mayor Mike. Now, I realize it's our 100th birthday, and it's nice to have our 100th birthday flag hanging on top of the City Hall, 
but I think it'd be a little nicer if they put the maple leaf up in the uh, our 100th centennial flag a little bit underneath it. Good show. Maple leaf and then the provincial flag and then the 100th centennial flag? Yep. Okay, bye. Much obliged. I'll tell Mikey. I don't know why people call him Mikey. He's the most unlikely Mikey. <laughs> Harcourt is much easier to say. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Um, I was wondering, I'm going to just ask you one quick question and then hang up. Um, I'd like to see what you write that's so weird and wonderful on your little pad of paper there. It's been driving me nuts for years. Thanks. UIC, Linda Boyd, Gail, whoever Gail is, RRSP, UIC. I do circular squiggles. Sometimes, though, when I'm in a bad mood, I do square squiggles. But I've got to have my pencil. My black pen. Go ahead, please. Oh, he's gone. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. How are you today? Fair to uh, good. I just wanted to phone you and, uh, and compliment you on your show this morning and uh, on also the day before yesterday. I thought you were very, very, you got right to the point with the, the fellow that started accusing you of, uh, of uh, the media. He, he, he really tore into you about the media and that there. I think he's, the, he's half the problem. He's half the problem. That's, that's right, he is. But, well, I'm glad you like that because, you know, when you look up at the board, you come in in the morning and I look up at the board and I see the names Paul and Lee and Lee. I think, oh, my goodness. This is going to be a dull program. But, I mean, it's one's conscience that drives us to do these kind of programs because we have a duty. That's to... right, Mr. Webster. You know, and I must say, you know, like I'm a Newfoundlander, and you are an excellent moderator. I mean, you know, you're well-informed on all the issues, uh, and especially about the politicians, you know. Like, I, I, you know, a lot of people say you're, uh, you're pro-NDP. I'm an ndp -er, but uh, you're, you know... Yeah, I think you're pretty fair all the way around. Yeah, yeah, so do I. Much obliged. Thank you very much. You've Have a nice day. Wonderful accent. Have a nice day. I can't do a Nufi accent. Go ahead, please. Hi, Jack. Hi. Uh, you, you were talking to the Minister of Labor a while ago. The only thing he didn't tell you is that he didn't appoint, uh, reappoint most likely the most popular member of the Wards Review representing the Labor Group, and that's Wally Payne. Oh, I missed that. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you talk about political viciousness, you know. Uh, he talked, he knocked off basically uh, a person who the labor movement has supported over the many years. The other thing is, it's sheer nonsense about Bud Gallagher representing the broad industrial relations community. Bud Gallagher is opposed by the trade union movement. He is acting on behalf of management as recently as three months ago on behalf of the Hotel Association, and really it's stressing the point to say that Bud, Bud Gallagher is going to be an independent chairman of the uh, administrative chairman of the Voice Review. I mean, it really stresses my uh, uh, and everybody else's imagination. When, what, what was Walt Payne doing before? What's Walt Payne? I don't get it. He was a firefighter, uh, if you recall. He was a Burnaby firefighter who got appointed, I guess, around 1973 or so. He has run, been doing an excellent job on the Voice of Review, and because he happens to belong maybe to the wrong political party, uh, you know, the Minister of Labor knocked him off. Well, of course, he was an NDP appointment, Art, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah, that is you, Art, isn't it? Yeah. Thanks for your call. I'll see you Friday morning. Get in. Much obliged. That was Art Cupid. And, you know, I thought, I know the guy, I know the guy, I know the guy, but it just was a minute or two before... The penny dropped. Time for a quickie. Go ahead, please. Jack, I don't know if the uh, three men that were on earlier gave you any indication of how many potential candidates they have in the, I believe, 69 uh, seats that would be in the legislature after this next election. Well, the Liberals, uh, Lee has got one, the Liberals have 12. And uh, Poland's going to a nominating meeting tonight. They may have a good number of candidates. Thank you very much. I've got to go we'll be back after the break. Whatever became of Art Kuby, BC Federation of Labour, apart from that phone call he placed on the program this morning, I'm going to have a good serious talk with Art Kuby tomorrow, President of BC Federation of Labour. 
and I'm going to talk to a lawyer on a kind of civil liberties bit about the doctor's files and also about these inability to name people in search warrants. Tomorrow, not very well said, 9 a.m. precisely. Expo 86, 71 days to go. I feel, a little out of, I feel a little out of focus. Yeah, just around the edges. Okay, so. thank you. <laughs> 